Good morning, everybody. Trust is complicated. It is nuanced, it is layered, it is multifaceted, it is mysterious, it is this gigantic, nebulous, important thing. Ah, and it's so critical for all of us, whether we are an artist, whether we are a brand, whether we are a company, an individual, a member of a family, a member of a nonprofit, it's critical for all of us to know how to manage and grow trust. But we live in an era with the lowest levels of trust ever recorded in decades. According to a ton of different research studies, we have lower ever, ever levels of trust now than we ever have in government, in business, in media, and in our neighbors. So how do we build trust in this era of mistrust? Today I'm gonna to share with you three ways that I believe, based on what's coming out of the research and some case studies, we can all learn how to build more trust in this era today. My name is, Woo is right. <laughs> My name is Neil Pasricha. I am the author uh, of a number of books, all focused on intentional living. My first book is called The Book of Awesome, which is all about gratitude. My most recent book is called The Happiness Equation, which is all about happiness. The book I have coming out this fall is all about failure and resilience. And the book I'm working on today is all about trust. So let's crack in to three ways that we can all learn how to build more trust today. Number one, the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is this idea of finite over infinite over infinite, infinite, finite, infinite, finite, finite over infinite. You know, when I was 10 years old, I got a Christmas present. Under the Christmas tree, I opened up my first ever little mini system. It had a front-loading CD player, a top record player, if you can believe it, two tape decks and a radio. And together with that package, as I ripped it open under the Christmas tree, I also got the CD that I'd asked for with it. Forever Your Girl by Paula Abdul. <laughs> Um, straight up, now tell me you guys like that too, obviously. <laughs> now look, I, I mean, over the time, I, I start going to the mall, I go to the East, I go to Tower Records, I go all these places, I start buying up, I start adding to my collection. I get, you know, Rhythm Nation by Janet Jackson, I get into Sir Mix-a-Lot, I get into a Technotronic, I'm adding to my collection, so eventually what I need is a CD binder, right? You know what I'm, who, ha who has had the CD binder? Okay, hands up, yes, exactly. First it was chronological, then I went alphabetical, then I went, I went, changed it up all the time. I started stuffing in tickets, you know, when I go to the concert, signatures, set list. Over time, this thing became my finite, trusted source of all my music. I moved with it, I took it everywhere. It was, I, I just knew whenever I wanted to listen to music, I opened my CD binder and I was given an incredibly high trust listening experience every time. But then it finally happened 25 years later when my wife, Leslie, got Spotify. <laughs> and I went from having a trusted and finite collection of all my music to like this totally infinite collection of every single song in the entire known universe, yet yeah, at the same time my trust in having a good listening experience shot com incredibly down. If it was like that video we just thought it would have like spiked down. Why? Because I didn't know what to pick. I'm like stuck. The whole time I'm in Spotify I feel like this. <laughs> I'm stuck. I'm stuck at a wall of all the music in the world. I, I mean I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. The whole thing is infinite. It's too much. And everything is infinite now. Instagram scrolls endlessly. It never stops. There's always another hashtag to click. At the end of the YouTube video, it auto plays another one forever. If you just leave it, the thing will just go to the computer. Dies, right? You watch Netflix, it just auto plays another movie. It's no wonder Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix, says, my biggest competitor of all is sleep. And as that quote continues, he then says, and we're winning. <laughs> the problem though, if for Reed and for me, is the problem is we're losing. We're losing, you know why? Because our brains are programmed to look for finite. We are used to looking for stopping points. We have had 200,000 years of evolutionary history looking for things that end, right? We scrounge till we find and then we're done. You want to read a newspaper? You open it up on the front page, you flip through till the end, then it's over, there's no more news till tomorrow. 
It's not just scrolling in every elevator corner, you know, it's just, it's just over. Remember how you used to watch a TV show? You get, you, it's Thursday night at 9, you turn on the TV show, it's over. You gotta wait a whole week. Or sometimes the whole summer, right? Our brains are looking for finite. We trust finite. We want things that end, okay? In an era of infinite choice, the value of curation skyrockets. The research agrees with this as well. Sheena Iyagar over at Stanford University took a, a study with Procter & Gamble of all the head and shoulders varieties on display. When she chopped them in half, guess what happened? Sales spiked. Daniel Gilbert at Harvard University has a really famous phrase, I love it, it's called the unanticipated joy of being totally stuck. He's written a number of incredible books all about happiness. He has this uh, interesting thesis that we all want to go to the movie theater with the most movies playing. We want the restaurant with the biggest menu, but actually we don't because we are happier and more trusting of the ones that have one movie playing or have a tasting menu that you don't got to pick anything, right? In an era of infinite choice, the value of curation skyrockets. What do I mean? I mean, last week I thought about buying a new laptop. So I go to hewlettpacker.com. I want to look at laptops. How many they got for sale? Over 250. There's work laptops and play laptops and gaming laptops and heavy duty. and light. It's too much. It's overwhelming. So I go over to Apple. They got six. They got six. Woo from the two guys that work at Apple in the corner. <laughs> I love that. Or maybe they're just internally disgruntled folks at Hewlett Packard. One of the two. <laughs> you ever been in a McDonald's drive-thru and the Dodge Caravan in front of you doesn't move forward? You're like, what are they doing? By the way, I don't know why it's always a Dodge Caravan. Is that just a Toronto thing? I don't know. It's always a Dodge Caravan. And, and you know why they're not moving? Because of this. It's overwhelming. What are you going to get? Now that you got breakfast at dinner, it's too much. You want an In-N-Out experience? Go to In-N-Out. Five things on the menu, you're in, you're out, you're done. <laughs> 10 years ago, I actually stumbled upon this idea of build, building trust when I started a blog called 1000awesomethings.com during a really tough part, part of my life. I was going through an awful year, a terrible year, um, uh, going through a divorce, and I lost a close friend uh, due to suicide. And I wrote this blog just to cheer myself up. I thought, for a thousand straight weekdays, let me write down one good thing, right? Old, dangerous playground equipment is awesome. The next day I come home, I write about the smell of bakery air. The next day I come home, I write about finally peeing after holding it forever. <laughs> and I was doing it for the awesome things, but over time I realized that the actual magic of this website was actually the 1,000. By having a finite number, I slowly earned the trust of an audience. By the time the blog was done, four years later, a million people were reading it every single month. I announced the number one awesome thing live on the national news. It's magical, because I had to be more curating as the blog went on. I had more ideas submitted to me, and I had less time and less blog posts left to do them. So arguably, arguably, the quality went up over time. So I copied my own model more recently when I decided to do a new project, searching for the thousand most formative books in the world. Again, I'm going to look for a thousand. I'm going to release it as a podcast called Three Books. And every single time I sit down with one of 333 of the world's most inspiring people, I'm going to ask them which three books changed their life. Like 1,000 also thinks it has an end date. This one ends on September 1st, 2031. It's not every weekday, it's every exact minute of every full moon and every new moon, because it takes two weeks to actually read people's three books and fly to them and talk to them about it. But the idea is the same, finite over infinite. In an era of infinite choice, the value of curation skyrockets. I honestly think this is partly why, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get like this awkward, stressful, untrustworthy feeling with all these infinitely long subscriptions that I have. You know, first I sign up for $10 for movies, $10 for music, to $5 for this website, $5 for that website, this much for Dropbox, this much for Google Drive, whatever, all this stuff. And then suddenly it's like, at some point you just notice, A, your credit card bill is really high. <laughs> and B, when you think to yourself, when's it going to end? You're like, oh, it's, it's infinity. It, it, the whole idea is that this thing never ends. It starts to feel a little bit overwhelming. I actually think this is part of the reason why things, like I mentioned earlier, tasting menus, chef's menus, are going up. 
right? That the popularity of them is going up. And maybe why over the last six years during what we call the retail apocalypse here in the States, when Amazon took over the book industry and they have 200 million books and they're always the cheapest, why over that exact same six year stretch, the number of independent, curated, finite bookstores spiked by 40%. Props to independent bookstores for anyone in the room that's a fan like me. So the number one thing I want to show you and talk to you about trust on this wheel of trust, this circle of trust, this thing of trust, I don't know what it's called yet, love your thoughts on it, is finite over infinite. Number two, human over algorithm. Human over algorithm. Uh, my wife Leslie and I have now been married over five years. We have um, a few, three young boys under the age of five. Our house is completely overwhelming. Uh, for anyone here that has children, uh, congratulations on escaping them briefly. Um, <laughs> but I'm going back today, and I'm going back into the chaos world. So last, last year one night, uh, we got the kids to bed by like 7.30, and Leslie looks me in the eye, and she's like, let's go to sleep right now. This second is more precious than water in our house. I'm like, let's do it. The sun's shining. Just close the blinds. We're in bed. Okay. We get up the next morning. She's checking herself and she's like, hey, you emailed me last night at 1030. I was like, no, I didn't. I was sleeping beside you. She's like, yeah, I know. But you know how you have that monthly newsletter where you send people like the books you read or whatever? She's like, I got that at 1030. I always thought you wrote that email and then press send. I was like, yeah, I used to. But then MailChimp has this new algorithm. It's called like you press this button and it optimizes the delivery for whoever's getting it. So I guess it optimized it for you because you check your emails in the morning or whatever. And she's like, you know what's so funny is when I got that email from you at like, you know, 5.30 in the morning when our kids woke up or whatever, I got it with like five other spam emails. And she's like, I, in, in my brain, yeah, I checked those emails, but they're all garbage to me. And I put you in the garbage. You became garbage. You became untrustworthy immediately, OK? Because I didn't realize that it was like an algorithm that was sending it. Maybe in an era of bots, we trust brains. Maybe in an era of bots, we trust brains. I had this thought kind of rattling around my head a few weeks after Leslie told me that. And I was at a bar near my house, Bar Raval in Toronto. If, you, if anyone is from Toronto, uh, down on College Street, Toronto's in the house. Thank you, guys, in the front. I appreciate you guys sitting in the front row, too. Uh, and I call my bots. How do I get home from a bar? I call the bot. I call, I call the algorithm. I call Uber, right? You press a button, a car whisks to the front of, 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 the, of the bar, and it whisks you home. That's a, that's a good deal. So I press the button, and like I always do, I don't know if you guys do this, I always like see who's picking me up, and I, I see the rating, you know? 4.5, loud GPS directions. 4.6, Maybe a bit messy, probably maybe smells like smoke. 4.7, 4.8, we're getting into like bottled water territory <laughs> here. Once in a while you see a 4.9, not very often. But I saw something that night as I was leaving the bar that I had never seen before in my life and I have never seen since. And it was this. A guy named Vish was picking me up with a 4.99 rating and almost 5,000 rides. So I looked at everyone around me at the bar. I'm like, I'm about to get a drive home. <laughs> from the world's greatest Uber driver. <laughs> people start high-fiving me, right? Like, you guys know what it's like down on College Street, people in the front. I'm like, people are high-fiving me, right? I go outside, I'm excited. I'm like, this is going to be so interesting. Like, what, what's going to be? Like, is it like, you know, Cristal in the back? What is, you know, what's up? So I, I open the door, and, and forgive the Indian accent. I grew up hearing it in my house and everywhere. It's the only accent I will ever attempt, OK? But I open the door. He looks me in the eye. He turns around. He's like, is it Neil? Is it Neil? I'm like, it is Neil. It is Neil. I get in the back seat of the car. We have this great conversation on the way home. He's funny. He's smiling. He's got a great personality, as you would expect, based on the rating. And as we get close to my house, I say, you know what, Vish? You might actually be the world's greatest Uber driver. I've never, I take Uber all the time. I've never seen a rating close to you. He's like, is it true? Is it true? I said, I don't know if it's true. He's like, there's no, there's no leaderboard. There's no way to check. He's like, all, all I can see is the last 500 ratings I've got. I was like, really? Can you show me? He's like, yeah, here it is. <laughs> That's an actual screenshot. He has 
500 straight. I'm like, no one's better than you. How could they be? <laughs> In an era of bots, we want brains. Maybe handshakes and smiles are what are actually becoming the scarcest resources of all. I thought about this a bit more and I was like, wait a minute, for years I've been going to this website, um, Get Human. But before I do, I, I, I wanted to tell you about Vish. So on Vish, we get home, I actually exchange personal information with him, I forgot to tell you, because like, otherwise we lose each other forever, right? Like I can't, no way of contacting him. So I exchange his personal information with him, and three weeks later I say, can you come on three books? Can you come on my podcast? I'll hail you from the front of my house, and we'll do it in the back of your car. So we do, he drives me around the city, we do the podcast, I write about it, I put it on, they put it on past company, it becomes the number two article on the entire website, okay? Uber starts catching wind of it, of course, so they start talking about it, they start sending it around. I do another podcast interview with Seth Godin, for those that don't know, marketing author, who's been 18 best-selling books on marketing. He says, Neil, you gotta do a book called 4.99, <laughs> Secrets to Customer Service Success from the World's Greatest Uber Driver. <laughs> For those that know Seth Godin, he was a book packager before he was a best-selling author. He's like got this brain for it. I was like, oh, that's funny. That, you know, maybe we should do that. And then my literary agent calls me up from New York and he's like, I don't know if you, if you realize this, Neil. There's a book in here. We got to do it. So right now as I'm speaking to you on the stage, the book proposal's in development right now for 4.99 by Vishwas Agarwal. By the way, why does that stick out? Like, why is that story? Usually when I, I want to write a book, I have, to tell, I have to convince everyone else. Like, I'm like, ah, I really want to write a book. Can you, please, can you please print it? This is the opposite. Everyone's coming to me. And I realize it's because we want human. We want humanity in the middle of our algorithms, right? We want hum human interactions. We want the smile. We want the handshake. And like I was saying a second ago, I thought about this. I'm like, I've been going to gethuman.com for years. I don't know if you know this site or not, but you know, if ever you're calling like a gigantic airline or a, a phone company and you don't know how to get a real person, you go to Get Human and it's like, call this number, press 1125, and then you get a real person, right? So you don't have to start again and try to figure out what code they're using to try to get a real person. So I, I always went to this website and uh, I started looking at it a little bit more. I'm like, what's going on with man and machine right now? What are the trends? So that first article is like, well, we don't like each other that much to start with. Like, they topple over our kids. Um, and, and the AV Club has this great headline. The, in San Francisco, a company uh, came up with a robot that, that kicked homeless people off, off the park benches outside of its offices. Predictably, the first night they did that, uh, the, the machine was covered in barbecue sauce and TARP, and as the AV Club says, uh, given a well-deserved ass-kicking. <laughs> so this question keeps coming up, right? Like, what's going on with, with humans and algorithms? So I look into the research a bit more. There's interesting research about it. Comes out of Turkey. They did a study. They asked people, hey, we're going to give you a stock, stock quote prediction of what's going to happen to a specific stock price. They told one group of people it's coming from an expert stock picker. They told the other group of people that it's coming from a, an, al an expert stock picking algorithm. They then said, you can tweak the dial if you want, and then let's see how close you were. Well, when people got the advice from the algorithm, they cranked that dial up or down. They didn't trust it. They didn't believe it. I'm not saying whether it was right or not. I'm saying, intuitively, we didn't really believe that one. We kind of trusted that stock picking one. So I'm like, where in our world, like this isn't, a, this isn't like a, a manifesto for like granny to start selling jam at the corner of the driveway. Like that's, I'm not saying that's the future, right? I'm, what I'm trying to say is like where in our algorithmic world that we already live in, we're already doing it, can we reinsert a little bit of humanity? You know what's an algorithm? McDonald's, how much ketchup is on the burger every time? What, how do they manage the lineup? How, the whole thing is now, how do they build a play place? So uh, we took my kids out to see my parents uh, just an hour outside of Toronto. Uh, whenever we go there, my, my older son's like, we gotta go to the play place. Cause in downtown Toronto, there's no play places in any McDonald's, there's just puddles of urine. <laughs> so, so we go to the play place and it's three stories of plastic towers, there's, there's you know, slides, it's, it's fun for them. And, and the thing that caught my eye was this sign on the wall. It says, Dear Parents, enjoy our play place. Every day it is cleaned and the inside is sanitized. It is inspected for safety. The surrounding area is also cleaned and washed. Every week we do this, every month we do that, every once in a while we do this. And the bottom line says, in, in the sort of light blue, it says, we want you to know this because our kids play here too. From Stacy and Mike Foreman, owners and operators. And I thought to myself, 
everything in McDonald's is an algorithm, but they clearly made this up themselves. How do I know? Because they violated the no magenta on blue design. <laughs> McDonald's would never have approved of this. <laughs> right? The, the font, they put their names on it. But it was the right decision. Maybe McDonald's didn't approve of it. Maybe McDonald's was like, make up your own sign. I don't know. All I'm saying is like, it worked because my trust in the play place skyrocketed. I was like, their kids are playing here. They have a sign about how frequently they wash it. I, I have their name. How often do you know the names of who owns the McDonald's? You never even know that, right? So it's as simple as that. Now, I don't know if it can go too far. Maybe that's the question we want to ask. Can it go too far? Can we insert too much humanity? The algorithm I'm experiencing right now, uh, just down the street here in Austin, is, is the housekeeping algorithm. Right? Your, your, your sheets are tucked in. Your towels are replaced. Maybe the floor is vacuumed. Your pillows are fluffed up. Have you ever got a handwritten note from the housekeeping staff in your hotel room. Anyone ever had that experience? Smattering of hands, maybe, maybe a quarter of people. Okay, so it's kind of nice, right? I hope you enjoy your stay from St. Juania. Uh, and, then, and then maybe this one. Do you like this one? Um, good morning. I noticed that you have been making your pillow of bath towels, so I made you one. I hope you will like it. Enjoy the rest of your stay here with us. Sandra. And. Uh, I was like, is this too much, too intimate? Like, I'm hand building you a, a pillow and a towels? <laughs> What's next, you know? Uh, but the reason I found this was because a guy wrote like a trumpeting blog post bragging about the service at the Delta in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He said he's got serious neck problems. He can never use hotel pillows. He stays in hotels all the time for work. He's been in 500 hotels. Everyone always puts the thing back, so he has to make it again. And he's like, for once, someone saw what I was doing and made it for me. He ended up seeking out Sandra. They had this meeting. He wrote a blog post. Maybe it's super service, right? I don't know. But can it go too far? This one's from the MGM Grand Signature in Vegas. Gentlemen, please choose an alternate surface for your cocaine. <laughs> You're affecting the finish on the wooden dining room table. Thank you, signature smiley face. In an era of bots, we trust brains, humans over algorithms. Now it's time for our third and final point. And this one is go all in, show all in. Okay, this is the complete model. I'm gonna pause three more seconds. I see a lot of people taking pictures. This is it, this is full, okay? I just have to shrink the font sizes a bit. <laughs> but I avoided the magenta, at least I did that. Okay, go all in, show all in. So, um, I'm walking around Toronto one day. Uh, there's a neighborhood just to the west of the downtown core called Parkdale. Uh, for those that may know Toronto, this is a kind of a grittier, grittier neighborhood, gentrifying neighborhood. I'm walking past kind of like the dollar stores, money marts, and I stumble upon this place called Craig's Cookies, right? Great neighborhood, artistic neighborhood, but I'm like, Craig's Cookies? What's this, a bright yellow building? No way, it just sells cookies? I walk into the store, sure enough, this is the display. There's no brownies. There's no tarts, there's no croissants, there's no pies, it's just cookies. A guy looks me in the eye, I presume he's Craig, he looks at me, he says, is it cookie time? <laughs> what are you gonna say? Or I'm like, hell yeah, it's cookie time. <laughs> two chocolate chips. <laughs> so I ordered two cookies. Uh, he says, hi, I'm Craig, you know, thanks for coming to my store. He's like, here's your, here's your chocolate chip cookies. And so I get the chocolate chip cookies, he looks me in the eye and he's like, you want a shot of cold milk? They only have one drink there. You can kind of see it in the background. It's just cold milk. That's it. All they sell is cookies and cold milk. So I leave this place and I'm like, wow, uh, good luck to that guy. Like, like how are you going to pay downtown Toronto rents by selling just chocolate chip cookies for $3 a pop? I'm like, I give this guy like a month. You know, but I'm such a nice guy. I'm, I'm super, I'm super nice to, I'm, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to send them a couple bulk orders. I'm going to like send a couple gift bag orders for the store. You know, I'm trying to keep them afloat. So I, I do that. I do that. And uh, I go back six months later. There's a different, first of all, it's open. Second of all, there's a guy behind the counter. It's not Craig. 
And I, I sort of come in, I'm like, hey, you guys are here. I'm like, this is great. I'm like, congratulations. He's like, what? What are you talking about? I'm like, I'm Neil. I'm the guy that's been sending you the bulk orders for once in a while. He's like, I like no idea who I am. I'm like, I'm like, I want like a pat on the back. I want like, thank you for keeping our, helping us pay the rent. He's like, dude, we do dozens of orders a day. I don't, I don't know how to keep track of them all. I'm like, dozens a day? He's like, yeah, like we're up at Nordstrom right now. We're selling 90 dozen a day before lunch. They invited us up rent free. They just want the smell of chocolate chip cookies in their store. <laughs> I'm like, you're selling 90 dozen a day just at one store that you're not even paying rent for? He's like, yeah. Go all in. Go all in. Why in this flat, complicated, loud world should you buy chocolate chip cookies from anyone besides the guy selling only chocolate chip cookies? Up in Canada, there was a cheese commercial, Black Diamond Cheese. When I was a kid, there was this great slogan called, our cheese has to taste better. It's all we do. I never quite got that until I saw this, but maybe the more chips you push into the middle, the more we buy your hand. The more chips you push into the middle, the more we buy your hand. Go all in. But what do I mean show all in? I mean show it. Show it, show it everywhere, scream it everywhere, tell everyone. Who does a good job of this? You know who does a good job? Five guys, burgers and fries. What do they got in the name? Fries. No one else has fries in their name. Burger King does not, Wendy's does not, McDonald's can't. You saw the menu board earlier, they'd call it McDonald's burgers and salads and drinks and nuggets and egg McMuffins and, and fries. Like you, you can't do it at McDonald's. So it's just fries. Why is it just fries? Well, you walk in, how do they show this? There's piles of potatoes and peanut oil right at the front door. If you don't turn, you bump, you walk right into it, okay? They're in bags and stuff, so it's sanitary, but you're basically walking down a lineup of potatoes. And then when you get to the front, there's a sign at the cash that says, today's potatoes are from Surrey or Surris, P-E-I, East Point Potatoes. I'm like, does anyone know where that is? I'm Canadian, I know PEI is Prince Edward Island, it's the smallest province, it's the Rhode Island of Canada, but an actual island. And, and there's this city on, on it called Surris, and the potatoes, East, this could be the worst potatoes in the world, the cheapest, I don't know. But they're showing all in, they're putting it up there, they're, set, they're changing the sign presumably whenever they get new, new kind of potatoes in. And even when you finish your burger and your fries, guess what's left in the bag? 50 more fries. <laughs> You know this, they dump a bunch of fries on top of the bag. By the way, if you want a salad like you're at McDonald's or you want onion rings like you're at Burger King, uh, you're out of luck. They have no other side dishes on the whole menu. If you want something with your burger, you must get fries. That's it, there's, there's nothing else, or nothing, right? Or another burger as a side dish, but there's nothing else. They're all in on fries. Go all in, show all in. Okay, we kind of get that, but what's the opposite? Well, it's kind of what all of us do right now, right? Like, me too, me included. I'm like, if you don't go all in, you're spread too thin. If you don't go all in, you're spread too thin. We don't know what you stand for anymore, right? Because the more chips you push in the table, the more we buy your hand. Like, this place, honestly, um... <laughs> maybe they have the best jerk chicken roti and pork fried rice and giant steaming plate of poutine. <laughs> I had to put poutine in the speech somewhere. And maybe Mike Ditka, Wayne Gretzky, and Dan Aykroyd really do have great wine. And maybe women really do want Zippo perfume. Who wants to smell like lighter fluid? I walked by this one down in Parkdale too. I mean, I do want a solution to my problems, but education and work, love and money, divorce, jealousy, black magic, health, business, <laughs> evil affection, marriage, family matters, husband, wife, property, court, enemy problems, <laughs> depression, despite the 100% guarantee on the palm, I don't buy it. <laughs> If you don't go all in, you are spread too thin. I know it's tempting to want to do something else. We all want to pivot. We want to do more. We want to do this. We want to do that. I get all that. I get it. But does it always work? No. Just ask Colgate. <laughs> yes, this is a real product. And yes, as you may have guessed, it has since been discontinued. <laughs> 
together, <laughs> these three things form the circle of trust, the wheel of trust, the thing of trust, the three things about trust that I feel strongly are emerging in the world today as new trends to build trust in this era of mistrust. Going finite over infinite. Adding more humanity back into the algorithms that we live in. Going all in and showing all in, letting us know what you stand for, what you believe in, telling us straight up so we can make an assessment, so we can understand you. Because the root of it all, the final thing about it, is that we do live in this era. We do. We do live in this era now. I said at the beginning, we're the lowest levels of trust ever before seen in our human history. We trust the media less. We trust our governments less. We trust businesses less. And we trust our neighbors less. So we ultimately have a choice. The final choice, the final question, which is what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in this low trust world that we're in right now where all we're trying to do is sign each other up for our email lists? You know, where we're walking billboards, we see attention spans, we see eyeballs, we see brains, we see monetizing everything. You know, I saw a billboard just down the street uh, this morning. It's like, this is how these companies see you, and it's the human figure as dollar signs. It's like, is that the world we want to live in, this vague, endless, infinite, algorithmic world of low trust? Or do we want to add back some human connection? Do we want to stand up for what we believe in and tell people that clearly? Do we want to go all in on that? Do we want to have finite offerings? Be clear about what we're passionate about. Let our passions lead us and put them out there. And do we want to live in a world with more compassion and more empathy and a lot more trust? I hope you would join me in saying yes. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you guys so much. It is an incredible honor to be up here today. This was only part one of our hour-long uh, time we have together. Part one is sharing that model about trust. And part two is doing a live case study on stage. Because when you see a model like this, you're thinking to yourself, well, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, how do I do this? There's a bunch of stuff I do right now in my life. I'm like, I got to get better at this. I mean, I got to get better at that. So I'm looking around the world. I'm like, who's doing this the best, right? Who can we learn from? Is it a company? Is it a startup? Is it a nonprofit? I think it's an artist who's also a business person, and his name is Frank Warren. And over 10 years ago, he started a community art project called Post Secret, where he invited total strangers from around the world to mail him their innermost confessions on postcards to his home address, right? 10 years later, postsecret.com has ballooned into the largest advertisement-free blog in the entire world. As of this morning, it has 815 million visitors. It has turned into six New York Times best-selling book, a totally viral TED Talk, a roving art ex exhibition that's at the Museum of Man right now in San Diego. It's been at the MoMA, it's been at the Smithsonian. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk to us all right now about bringing trust to life, please help me welcome on stage Mr. Frank. Warren. Thank you so much. Wow. My friend. Great to be here. Great to have you. So Frank, I just threw up this picture of, uh, of the million postcards oh, yeah. that you have collected. And my wife Jan stacking a brick of 250 <laughs> on top. Uh, so talk to us, Frank, about trust. Well, even in the DNA of Post Secret, I wanted to have economy, so I started with a postcard, a very finite amount of space to focus your confession, your truth, your story, and leave out all the, the fat, the excess. Also, when people mailed them to me, I created this, I felt, trusting relationship with people in the digital world. I treated their secrets with honor, with respect. The website wasn't monetized. I used my home address and sharing the stories back out to the community. I didn't do it all at once, as you see on a lot of blogs, with archives and a list of blowing up blogs and episodes. I just had, if you go there, every Sunday there's about 30 secrets. They're all new. You go back next week, those are gone. There are new secrets. I wasn't interested in kind of gorging people's appetites for secrets. I was interested in building relationships. Frank, Frank that point that you just made, uh, I think I told you last night as I, after I flew in, I was like, when I went to postsecret.com for the first time, because at this point I want to blow it up a bit, there's nothing to click on on the website. There's no about page. There's no contact page. There's no history. There's no archive. There's no back button. It's just one actual page. That's it. And I was like, no blog I've ever been to has nothing else except this one thing. 
I made a mistake early on. At the beginning, I was posting secrets and writing my little commentary and thoughts about them, and nobody wanted to hear what I had to say. <laughs> so I quickly learned to cut that away and just have a black background and these amazing voices, these stories, these confessions that really resonated with people and allowed others to feel like they were part of it and want to participate, and it, it kind of created this community. And for me, it's a thrill to come to events like this and have people come up to me and talk about how they've been visiting the website for over a decade. I think building those relationships has really panned out and it's special. Yeah, and so part of what I'm hearing there is the finite idea of the postcard, the finite idea of the website. And so when you have 850 million visitors, you really do. You're not creating a, like a maze that you can't, an inescapable thing that you can't get out of like most things are right now. You know, like you, you can leave right away. You know, you aren't trying to suck people in. And talk to us a little bit about human over algorithm. There's something very algorithmic about Post Secret. Mm. Um, I think when I go to it, I'm like, if I'm if I'm right, you post like like right at midnight kind of thing on, on Sunday morning, yeah. Sunday secrets. Yeah. And um, so and so it's methodical. I think you said 10 postcards or 20, yeah. right? So you have this certain number, the certain date, the certain time. At the same time, you're being very careful about what you choose. So how how do those two things, human and algorithm, come together? My, my agent and I have an argument about what the secret sauce of post secret is. I think it is the nature of the relationship I've been able to develop with strangers who've never met me. And my agent thinks it's the curation process that I go through, the stories I tell with all of our secrets. And there is a lot of thought that goes into that. I select the secrets Saturday night very carefully. It's an hours long process. I, I get into this flow, the hands on the clock just start spinning around. I'm taking all these voices and trying to knit them together into this conversation that tells our story. I'm using literary techniques like a, a setup and a punchline, a call and response, ending with a story that connects to the beginning part of the story, having kind of dialogues within it. Sometimes I feel like a film editor and I'm editing together different scenes from individuals' lives to collectively tell our story. So there's an element there you've talked about on finite versus infinite, on human over algorithm. The last point that we made this morning is on going all in. Okay, yeah. and I'm, by the way, I'm super jealous of you because like I, I said to the audience earlier, I'm like, I don't do that. Like, I, I, I'm like doing a podcast over here. I'm like, I'm, 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 I'm speaking over here. I'm like writing a book about this topic. And so I'm always like, the fact that you're all in on one thing, I'm so envious of it. But how does that balance with what I'm assuming most people think, or I think, I'm like, what if I want to do something different? What if, I, what if this isn't working out profit-wise or business-wise yeah. and I want to have a new creative out, out, output somewhere? Like, how do you decide how much to steer the ship, the ship one way. Part of it was crazy faith. When I started Post Secret, I was living in the suburbs. I was a husband, pet owner. I was a, an entrepreneur with my own business. And here I was collecting secrets from strangers. It really went against the identity, how I saw myself, how others saw me. I called up my mom and told her I was soliciting secrets from strangers on <laughs> postcards. And she called the idea diabolical. <laughs> <laughs> I looked it up when I was talking to her. I said, you mean of the devil, Satan's work? And yes, that's exactly what she meant, as it turns out. <laughs> but my, ho my uh, home address is on the cover of the Post Secret books. It's all over the web. When I told my wife that, she said, uh, couldn't you have used the P.O. box instead of our home? And I said, don't worry, Jan, this won't last long. And that was 14 years ago. And people like, dr have driven by your house and knocked on your door and things like that. Taking pictures, selfies with the Post Secret mailbox, for sure. Um, and as the years have passed, the commitment to Post Secret has, has not wavered. I feel like one of the reasons it's become more than just a hot website is because I put the priorities of the community and the project first. And I've kind of committed to follow where Post Secret leads me. So for example, I, I have a lot of offers to speak at conferences and conventions, and I do that sometimes, but I've always stayed true to sharing the secrets on college campuses with young people and talking about the idea of stigma and mental wellness and transformation through sharing our secrets and supporting others. And so the purpose alignment with Post Secret, I think is another reason why I've been able to make but that all-in push. But any downsides of going all-in? Like I'm assuming Craig gets sick of cookies at some point. He doesn't eat cookies anymore, right? Yeah. Like, do you ever get sick of postcards? How, what do you do when the project you're working on, tire, you tire of it or you just, you want to take a vacation even? Like how do you... Do, how do you balance the idea of going on? Maybe I'm just personally struggling with that, but how can you tell us about when you have wanted to jump? 
for whatever reason, I feel very connected to secrets. As a kid in my family, we had family secrets, and then later I realized secrets were being kept from me by my family. And so maybe this insatiable desire for secrets for some pathological reason. <laughs> I know my wife hopes eventually we'll, we'll move to Florida and retire and be done with this, but I hope the secrets always follow us because I, to this day, I still feel like a kid Christmas morning going to the mailbox and seeing the gifts that people are sharing with me and with the whole community. Thank you very much to Frank Warren for sharing some of what makes Post Secrets oh. magical in building trust. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, for the work you're doing. Thank you to Hugh, to Sarah, to the entire AV team. Thank you to all of, all of you to for coming. We said at the beginning, trust is vague, nebulous, ambiguous, layered, textured, complicated. We hope that we have shone a little bit of light into this big topic today. Thank you very much for your time. Brother.